the one who is able to overcome the struggles and the calling of his nafs, his, his lower self, that beast within him, he will be successful. The guys on the street corners, their, their drug is cocaine and crack. Mm. Our drug of today is the drug of social media. I think one of the biggest things to realize and understand is that you are wasting your life away. Mm. Wallahi. You're genuinely wasting your life away when this happens. Some of my mates that I grew up with are starting to leave the deen of Islam. Mm -hmm. How can I advise them when I'm not the perfect Muslim? So your friends, are they at school with you? Yeah. And do they have other friends that are not practicing Islam as well? I'm, I'm sure they do, right? Yeah. Okay. So have they left Islam or are they thinking about leaving? Thinking about leaving. They're thinking about leaving yeah. Islam. So a lot of the times, my bro, the reason they're thinking of leaving Islam is because of two main reasons. They don't really identify themselves as a Muslim and they have a lack of knowledge. But then there's a third reason and that could be some type of trauma or some type of past experience that plays into their psyche that really harms them. And if you try and unpackage that, what ends up happening is that you kind of realize that there's like an underlining factor, an underlining kind of reason as to why they are feeling the way they're feeling. So the first thing I would do is maybe get them to open up, speak to them. You know, but speak to them not in a group, but speak to them on a one-on-one -on -one level. Take them out, you know, buy them some food, sit with them. You need to realize that a lot of the times people have their walls up straight away. So when you talk to them, what's going to happen is they're going to have these walls up. And when they have these walls up, it's your job to make them feel that there's a safe space with you. And that sometimes takes something small, just like buying them some lunch or, you know, putting an arm around the shoulder or just being empathetic and listening more than talking. When you can start to do that, then once they slowly start opening up a little bit, then go to the next stage, which is to try and under, understand the underlining problem. And a lot of the time it's family trauma, it's abuse, it's some type of issue that they're going through at home, or it's something that they've seen. And a lot of the times it could even be some type of ignorance, a lack of knowledge, or something that they've read, or it could be some type of shubahat or doubt. Once you identify what they're going through, then it's your job to provide some type of a solution, inshallah. So, have you spoken to them? Have you had a sit down with them? Uh, not yet. Not yet, okay. So that's, that's the first thing I'd say, is sit down with them and speak to them. The second thing I'd say, essentially, is if someone's, trying, if someone's contemplating leaving Islam, let's look at it from the perspective of ignorance. So say, for example, they don't know uh, about certain things, or they've read something and they think it's a contradiction, or there's like a doubt that they have, or, you know, it could be anything. If there's a contradiction of the Quran, the age of Aisha, it could be something along the lines of evolution. Many different things could be the reason why they're contemplating that. So it would be upon you as a good friend to sh share videos with them, to share content with them, to speak to them about certain things, certain problems that they may have. And therefore, your job is to find a video that answers their problem, answers their questions if you yourself can't answer it. And as Allah says in the Quran, فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلَ الذِّكْرِ إِن كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ Ask those who know if you do not know. Speak to your teachers, speak to your elders, etc. And make sure that you're also grounded so that you don't get these doubts as well, inshallah. And lastly, if it comes to some type of emotional trauma that they're going through or some type of identity crisis, something else like that, remember to be empathetic. Remember not to rush the gun. Remember that you'll be able to see this person every day in school. So you don't have to give all the answers straight away. But sometimes just being there for them and also just bringing them into an Islamic environment. Here's the best thing you can do. Unorthodox, but here's, here's, here's what I would say. Go to your friends in the masjid, if there's a youth night, if there's an event happening. You're 15, 16 years old. Young people are impressionable at this age. So here's what you do. You say to your friends, listen, I've got a friend, he's thinking about leaving Islam. He doesn't really have an Islamic identity. So now you go to this friend of yours, you say, listen, let's go to you know uh, an event that's happening. There's free food, entice it, dangle the carrot. Hopefully, if he says yes, you know, take him to the masjid, and then the boys are already there welcoming him. And wallahi, let me be real with you, bro. Sometimes it's less about information and more about just making him feel loved and making him feel like he's part of an environment and part of a, a, a masjid or a group, etc. that he's never been part of before. I'll tell you what we do. Whenever we have an event, I say to all the brothers, young brothers, your age, 13, 14, 15, 16, I say to them, uh, I'm going to take you all out for dessert and it's all on me. I'm going to pay for it. Yeah. And it's the best 70, 80 pounds that I spend in the week. 
Why? Because these guys probably haven't had their father show them that amount of love. These guys haven't had an older brother or someone that they look up to take them out, arm around the shoulder, spend some time with them, talk to them, actually allow them to feel comfortable with you. And so if you can create that type of a safe space for them, most of the time you'll realize that it's just a lack of identity and it's just a lack of belonging. And these are the few main factors that I feel are leading to that, inshallah. All right, so on that point, there's some friends that when we do talk to them, we, re we realize that they're really closed-minded and they're not willing to change. And on that basis, how do we make friends that are willing to get us closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And how do we leave those out respectfully mm -hmm. so it doesn't come out as rude? And how do we leave those bad friends? Perfect. So I'm, I'm assuming you're talking about school, right? Yes. So in school, there's a different dynamic because you're going to see these people every single day. And if you have friends that, for example, are not good for you and you know that they're not good for you and if they're having an impact in your life, then what you really need to do is you need to understand that these people will eventually, sooner or later, have a negative impact on your life if they haven't had one already. So the best thing to do is to respectfully, you don't have to announce it. You don't have to come out to them and be like, hey guys, uh, I will be leaving you now. So, you know, just, it doesn't work like that. The way you do it is very, very simple. You move away from them slowly. And remember, you need to replace them as well. But you don't tell them, you don't say to them, look, listen, hey guys, I'm going to leave you. You say, move away. You just stop, you know, hanging out with them at lunchtime, etc., break time or whatever. And then your job is to then make sure that you, you replace that. Mm. But here's the thing. A lot of the times you feel like you're abandoning them. You feel like you're leaving them out. This would be my advice. And this is a big problem that a lot of youngsters have is that they sometimes make the mistake of preaching to a crowd. So let's say now, friends, for example, I have a friend who I'm leaving because he's not a good influence for me. What do I do now? You leave him, you go and hang out with some new friends, and that's it. You've almost like left him alone. Okay, here's what you need to do. You need to go to him on his own and say to him, listen, why don't you come and spend time with these guys? Why don't you come and get some food with us? Be strategic about it. Okay, if you go in a group, here's what's going to happen. You're going to speak to him and his four or five friends who are, your, who are your old friends. Instantly, what's going to happen is because they're with each other, the boys are going to, you know, nudge each other. Hey, look at him. You know, they're going to have banter. They're going to basically make you feel like, you know, you're a loser. And boys are boys. So when they're with each other, they're all egging each other on, etc. All it takes is for one guy to look at another person, him to cut an eye with him and just feel like, <clears throat> like a little laugh. And instantly they've socially outnumbered you. Remember to get them on their own. Once you get them on their own, then you can slowly bring them into your new environment. And once you bring them into the new environment, then if their heart is open and if they're willing to be humble and if they're willing to, you know, be part of this new circle, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will essentially guide them inshallah. And your job is to just plant the seed. You know, bro, we're only farmers on earth. Mm. We're here just to plant seeds. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will grow it if he wants. You know, school's getting a bit too hard. It's too much work. How can I balance school and my religion? Okay. So, when school does get hard, here's what advice I give some of the younger brothers. You need, to realize, you need to realize that now is a chance for you to understand how to structure your day. You know, just understanding kind of how, how to be productive. And it's a good thing, by the way, because it's better you learn productivity tips now than you learn it once you have wife and, children, wife and kids and businesses and work and all that sort of stuff. Learn how to manage your time now before you become older. So this is the best time now. 15, 16, beautiful age, because now you're getting close to, in the UK we have GCSEs, right? You're getting close to your kind of end of school exams now, right? The best thing I would say is, look at what the Prophet ﷺ, he said, he said, he said, an hour for this and an hour for that. So your job isn't to do one and neglect the other, but your job is to segment things in your life. So now here is two hours to study and all I'm going to do is study. Okay, and then when it comes to the religion, pray your salah and then give a portion of that time that you're going to have free le there for reading Quran, for maybe watching a lecture or going to the masjid. What I often find is that the problem in my own community is I've noticed that some people, they basically don't come to the events because they, they, they're revising, right? And what that normally does is that that basically makes them forget about any kind of Islamic attachment and then they're fully focusing on their schoolwork and then they totally neglect this. You can do both. It's just about being very, very deliberate and conscious about segmenting your time. Okay. And also remember, there's barakah in the early mornings. So the Prophet ﷺ said, 
that they are, there is a blessing in the early morning hours. So if you wake up then, you're not on your phone, you're not on Snapchat, you're not on TikTok or Instagram, etc. Why? Because everyone's asleep. You're up, you're awake, no one's going to message you for a good few hours. Use that time, especially in the early mornings, to start with your Qur'an, start with your Islam. Start with some type of Islamic habit or Islamic productivity uh, kind of um, thing that you can do in the morning. And then go into like deep work. So what helps me is because obviously I, I do a lot of editing, I do a lot of filmmaking, creativity, all that sort of stuff, etc. And then I have family, then I have work, then I have business, then I have, you know, my masjid and other things, etc. I try and do something called deep work. And it's a book, it's a book that I read, it's, it's called Deep Work, right? Uh, okay, tell I don't really read it, I have the audible, right? So I, I listen to it and it's basically telling about, it's the science around deep work where you basically focus in on one task for a good un, undisturbed period. So you turn your phone off, put it on silent, put it on airplane mode, etc. And then get the work done. If you create a habit of this now, by the time you're 24 and 26, you will have so much more life and so much more experience and so much more miles doing productivity and doing genuine real work than those people that just haphazardly want to just be productive. So be conscious and be deliberate about your productivity, inshallah, and make dua to Allah to make it easy for you, inshallah. Well, on that basis, the reason some kids do that is because their parents have a certain expectation from them. What can we do to meet their expectations to our efforts? So a lot of this advice is very difficult because we're speaking to the wrong people. We're speaking to the child, <laughs> right? So only, the only thing we can give him is a coping mechanism. The main people we're here to really speak to for something like this is a parent. And as a parent, it's important for them to understand that although they have an expectation of the child, they really need to understand that, especially when it comes to kind of pressure times, like end of year exams and these sort of things, a child's mental state is very, very important for it to be healthy. Because what ends up happening is that they start to get resentful because their parents have always done this and that. And children remember these things, especially as young people going through puberty, in this critical age in their life, this is, the, this is now the time in their life where they are really feeling every emotion. So if they feel a bit of coldness from their mom or the doubt or that, or that pressure, oftentimes by the time they're 22, 23, 24, they'll remember these things. And as a parent, it's our job as parents to make sure that we understand that we're emotionally intelligent with our children, that we understand, you know, the workload on them. And we have to understand that our expectations need to be managed as well, because they're just, they're just humans. They're just children. It's their first time on earth, you know. So that's the advice I'd give to parents. But for, for the youngsters, for the guys that are going through this, what you need to understand is that your parents want the best for you. Okay. They don't want bad for you. A lot of the times, youngsters, they start to have some resentment in their heart for their parents because their parents are basically pushing them too hard. Just know that everything that your mother and father say to you is coming from a position of love. Yeah. It's not coming from a position of hate. It's not coming from any bad place. No one will be more sincere with you than your mother and father. Yeah. And you will only realize that really and truly once you become older and once you have your own kids. So you as a youngster right now just know that the reason they're hard on you is because they love you. Yeah. And once you can really understand that, then what they say to you, you know it's coming with, from, from love. Because a lot of the time you just think your parents are being hard upon you, harsh upon you, they're putting all the pressure upon you. And the reality is they're doing that because they love you. So it's your job now to understand that, yeah. and to work hard and push yourself a little bit as well, inshallah. You know, sure. you're never going to match the expectation. Yeah. Listen, if you're a desi child, yeah. believe me, yeah, you will never match the expectation. If you get an A star, they're going to they're gonna find some way to criti critique you. That you got 99%. Why was it not 100%? You know, they're going to find something. Yeah. And, uh, you know, subhanAllah, especially because our parents have got a great emphasis on education. Yeah. And for them, you have to realize that they think that this education is the be all and end all of life. Yeah. One thing I'll say to youngsters is look, education is important. And it's so important that you focus on it. But really and truly, don't let it get you down. Don't let it break you. Because life doesn't end at education or at school. Life is a lot. Bigger than that, you know, and sometimes the most successful people on earth They, you know, were C-grade students So I'm not saying don't have a lack, don't have, you know, any ambition I'm saying have ambition, but I'm just saying It's not that deep, inshallah, go easy on yourself How can I avoid fitna in a school environment When most of us are engaging in it? Okay Fitna is very difficult, especially in mixed schools, you know The reality is Guys like girls, girls like guys, right? That's just how it is. And 
in a school environment, you have to realize is that what you've got is you've got everyone in like this melting pot. It's very difficult to manage it if it's in your face. But wallahi, one thing I would say is that it's very, very important to know that this is probably going to be one of the hardest tests for you, for school kids and for guys at university. And remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says something very, very profound in the Quran. He said, وَمَن يُقَشُحَ نَفْسِهِ فَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْمُفْلِحُونَ That the one who is able to overcome the struggles and the calling of his nafs, his, his lower self, that beast within him, he will be successful. Why? Because success lies in restraining Restricting your desires. You know, Allah says in the Quran, He says that those who follow their desires, they are like cattle, they are like animals, rather they are worse. All they do is follow their desires. And wallahi, if you just zoom out a little bit and you look at the guys at school and they're just kind of chasing the girls and they're trying to get into drugs, and trying, what are they like? What do animals do? You want to procreate, you go procreate. You want to go and defecate, you go and defecate. You want to go and eat, you go eat. Is that what life is all about? So understanding that you're different as a believer and understanding that the core essence of your life is knowing and being aware of the one who created you and that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the second thing is to always make sure that your environment outside of school is a powerful environment. This environment has to be such a strong magnet for your iman, just pulling your iman and just really, really just giving you that kind of safe space your masjid, your teachers, your ustads, even just coming and being part of some type of that organization, some charity or volunteering at an event or doing something. This activism, Allahi, is probably one of the most important things to safeguarding you. And I look at two guys, right? I look at two people in my local area. I mentor guys exactly your age. So we've got like this kind of focus group of, we call it ISOX. Islamic societies and they're 16, 17 years old. They're, they're the high school Islamic societies, so not even university. Yeah. So high school MSAs, you could call it. Mm. And I look at the guys that are, alhamdulillah, like I'm telling you, man, like girls don't want them and they don't want girls. Like literally, they just kind of, you know, just so good when it comes to fitna and mm. all the problems, etc. Why? Because this brother, he is active and he's busy and he's engaged in some type of that work. Either he's arranging a Jummah khutbah or he's putting out some kind of content or creating posters or doing something or volunteering at the masjid. Even if it's as simple as being the one that hands out the pizzas or cleans up the rubbish afterwards or just helps put out the chair for the speaker. Being involved for young people, what that does is that it takes up brain space. Now when brain space is taken up, that means that you're no longer lazy because laziness and free time and being relaxed and comfortable is one of the biggest reasons why young people fall into fitna. Mm. And if you ever think about it, the reason why we scroll on TikTok, the reason why young people watch pornography, the reason why a lot of the times we have these vices and problems in our lives is because of the fact that we have loads of free time. Mm. I mean, you wouldn't scroll on your phone if I mean, you were busy, right? Yeah. If you were doing something productive. So one of the biggest reasons after the fear of Allah and after being conscious and after understanding what Allah wants from you is to make sure you occupy your time. Because if you're not occupying your time, believe me, something is going to be occupying your time. And most of the time, it's fitna and it's your desires. So the way you fight your desires is by tricking it into being busy into making sure that brain space is occupied. I'm Okay, I know I have to be at the masjid for six o'clock. I have to make sure that the drinks are put out. Okay, fine, the drinks need to be put out, fine. I need to make sure I clean up afterwards. Okay, I need to make sure I need to get this. What time is the speaker coming? This and that. Your brain is occupied. Wallahi, let me tell you something. That's one of the best things you can do, especially in this golden age of your life, which is from the age of 16 to 20, before you really start thinking about marriage. So for those at MSAs and those at school, now is the time to get active. Now is the time to be busy. Islamic work is so, so important, yeah. especially in the West, man. A big problem in the youth and among some adults as well, the question is, I'm on social media too much, what do I do? First thing to really do is unpackage what the purpose of social media is. Yeah? Mm. So Instagram, and this is really good for those people who are, want to become content creators as well, to understand the algorithm and how it all works, etc. Instagram has one purpose, that's to make money. Okay? Instagram is a business, mm. never forget that. And so, because Instagram, for example, wants to make money, how do they make money? They sell ads. Okay? So what do they want? They need people to be on the app, and they need people to spend time on the app. So they have two objectives. Be on the app, get new people on the app, 
and get people to stay on the app. That's the only objective that they really have. Because when you can collect data and give analytics to Nike and to IBM and to all these big corporate, you know, corporate organizations, etc., and you can say to these big companies, here, look, we've got this many people on the app and we've got, people spend an average three minutes on the app. They can then sell a better package to these advertisement companies. So these advertisement companies are like, oh, okay, Instagram got this, okay, okay, LinkedIn has this, okay, Snapchat has it, okay, because they're all competing amongst each other, okay? So now, what they do, Meta and Instagram, etc., their aim is to keep you on the app. So just remember that everything is done deliberately, okay? So the algorithm is a conscious, deliberate algorithm made to make sure that they are fulfilling the objective of what? Getting new people and retaining people and keeping people on the app. Okay, now we've established this. Let's understand what, what the real meaning behind Instagram and Meta and their aim is. You're on the app, you watch a video. The first three seconds, the moment you watch those first three seconds, now what they do is they show that video to 10% of your audience. And if you carry, and if that 10% carries on watching it, then they show it to new people mm -hmm. and they get new people on board on your following, watching the video, etc. And then they push out the videos that keep people watching after three seconds. Why is that so crucial to know? It's because their purpose is to hook you, is to get you in straight away, and is to get you to stay on the app. Because it's got over 2 billion people on the app. Okay. When they do this now, you are subconsciously creating something within you and that is the addiction of dopamine. Mm. So what your mind is doing is that your mind is getting used to a temporary fix mm. of this small little enjoyment, mm. this small little bump, this small little this fix that happens. So your attention span is now getting... You know, it's, 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 it's like decreasing. Your kind of expectation of what good content is, of what to be entertained, it's inflating. So now what's happening is that you get this little kick. Oh, then, you, then you swipe again. You get this little kick, you want to swipe again. You get this little swipe again. Okay. We keep getting these little hits, 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 hits. And now they've hooked you. Now they've got you. It's like a drug. But the way I say it, bro, wallahi, the guys on the street corners, their, their drug is dr cocaine and crack. Mm. Our drug of today is the drug of social media because it plays on the same chemical chemicals within your body, right? It gives you that same feeling, yeah. that dopamine, that rush. So now, the very first thing is to be conscious and aware of that. What am I doing? Why am I scrolling? What's happening to me? And to fight it actively because I find one of the biggest problems is, is this constant need. That's our addiction, right? Yeah. So for us, we, we are addicted as well. But it's just very, very different. And we think it's innocent. But now what ends up happening is, is we now become dependent on it. Okay, so now we've established what this is and why and what it's doing to us. How do we fight it? You know, bro, this is one of the hardest things in today's day and age, me personally speaking, I find for myself and I think youngsters are going through as well. I think one of the biggest things to realize and understand is that you are wasting your life away. Mm. Wallahi. You're genuinely wasting your life away when this happens. And if you look at your screen time and you look at how many hours you spend on the app, you will understand and know that, Wallahi, I could have done so many different things. Mm. I could have been involved in so many different projects. I could have done, been so much more productive. But what do we do? We, when you actually calculate your screen time and observe how long you've been on the app, yeah. it's horrific. Add all of that up throughout your life and it's only going to increase and it's only going to get worse. Guess what ends up happening? You're losing like two years of your life, man. Mm. Two to three years of your life you're losing. Imagine what you could do in two to three years of your life. Yeah. Being conscious of this is so important and fixing this habit now is so important. There's many apps that people can do which is to manage and limit screen time. Those are one of the things I'd say. The other thing I'd say is to, on your Instagram, on your TikTok, look, listen. You know Abu Taymiyyah? Yeah. He's a very good friend of mine. Mm. He says, everyone get off TikTok. And I said to him, look, look listen, I, that's good advice, but why don't we try and help them manage it? So my approach is a little bit different, mm. right? My approach is fine, you're on TikTok. I'm not saying join TikTok, but I'm saying if you're on TikTok and if you scroll on TikTok, here's what you do. Clean up your full you page. Go onto any video that is haram, that does not benefit you in this dunya or the akhirah. Long press hold it and press not interested. Mm. Unfollow every single page that is not good for your dunya or akhirah. 
And then when you are scrolling, you know, you have something called lazy productivity. Yeah. So now, for example, I'm studying AI. I'm learning about AI. I'm learning about kind of uh, different things, etc., regarding AI and business and, you know, kind of side hustles and stuff like that, etc. But all of I, I learned all of that through Instagram. I learned all that through Instagram. So for me, the way I kind of see this is here is me trying to provide a solution to the young people as to how they manage their social media screen time. So for me, bro, if I'm honest with you, scrolling on TikTok and Instagram is like, it's productive for me. Because if all you're doing is watching stupid memes, then the reality is, is that, yeah, it's going to give you problems long term. Right? Yeah, cool. A meme every now and again is fine, right? I'm not saying don't watch memes. I'm just saying, in reality, Use it for productivity, use it for Islamic knowledge, mm. and use it to better yourself. And that's one way to fight it. Another way is screen time, and then ultimately knowing the aims and plans of these apps, and consciously going against the grain. Definitely. So, khairan. That's what you said, for yeah, yeah, no your answers. May Allah make it easy for all of our young brothers and sisters. Amin, ya Rabbi. Oh, yeah, alhamdulillah. Pleasure.